So in this next subsection, we'll consider numerical integration methods. Well, we know that the relation between the Z domain and the Laplace domain is the following relation. And what we'll do here is approximate this relation and this will yield a relation between Z and S, an approximate relation. And this will allow us to obtain an approximation of a transfer function in S. To do that, let us consider an integral system. Okay, this is indeed a signal, a system, sorry, that integrates the input signal. Remember that you can see this as follows. And if we take the inverse Laplace transform, this is what you obtain. We integrate to obtain Y and here it's crystal clear that the output can be written as the integral of the input. So in discrete time, what do we do? We replace T by K T S, right? So we have K T S here and we would like to write this as a recursive equation. So this is the output of the integrator at time KTS and we would like to write it as the output at the previous sampling instant. So it's an integral from minus infinity to K minus one TS, right? And then we have to add a term to make sure that this corresponds to what you have over here. Okay, so this is kind of the correction term. So the output of the integrator at sample k is the output of the integrator at sample k minus 1 and you have to add the area under the curve in between k minus 1 and k. Okay, so here I have used the indices k and k minus 1. If you work with times, you have to use kts and k minus 1 ts. With discrete time notations, we say that the output of the integrator at sample k is the output of the integrator at the previous sampling index k minus 1, plus a correction that is the area under the curve in between the samples k minus 1 and k. If we work with times, well, this correction is the area under the curve in between the times k minus 1 ts and k ts. This area can be approximated using many rules. We'll show three methods backward rectangular, forward rectangular. These are the so-called Euler numerical integration rules and then trapezoidal. And this method is also known as Dustin's method or the bilinear approximation method. So we'll start with the Euler backward difference method. Remember that the equation that we're using is the following one. So the output of the integrator at index k, right, is the output of the integrator at index k minus 1 plus a correction. So the output of the integrator at index k minus 1 will kind of approximates this surface over here. etc. So what we have to add is what is shown here in blue. It's an approximation of this area. So what we'll do is approximate it by the area of a rectangle that is shown here in gray, right? And it's quite easy to obtain the area of this rectangle since it has a base of ts and the height here is simply x of k. So this is the area 
an approximation of the area in blue, it's precisely the area that is here in gray, right? So this is the description in discrete time. So what we can do is go to the Z domain, right? If we take the Z transform of this equation, neglecting initial conditions, this is what we obtain, right? And now we can have a look at the transfer function y between y and x so we'll have if we this one goes on the other side 1 minus z minus 1 y of z is equal to ts x of z so this is what you obtain this is in terms of the variable z minus 1, but you can also write it in terms of the variable z. So this is a description of my integrator in discrete time using the Euler backward difference. In English, we say that the value of xk is projected back. Okay, in French we call this the method, la méthode des rectangles à droite. So it's the value that is to the right that is used. So the idea is now that we compare this discrete time integrator obtained using the Euler backward difference method to the continuous time description of the integrator so we equate this transfer function in s with this transfer function in z and this gives you the approximation rule that you can use right if you take your transfer function and you replace s by z minus 1 over z t s then you obtain an approximate discrete time description according to this euler backward difference rule so this is s as a function of z you can very easily see that right so we'll have z is sts minus 1 is equal to minus 1 so z is indeed 1 over 1 minus ts S. this is what we have over here and again if you remember that exponential of x is approximately 1 plus x when x is small you can see that this is 1 over the exponential of minus tss so the exponential of tss so this Euler backward difference well numerical integration method indeed approximate the relation z is the exponential of tss as you can see so this is the relation between s and z that we had obtained using this backward euler difference method and we will see that it maps the j omega axis you've got it over here on a circle centered in z is equal to a half and with a radius a half so you can see that a transfer function with poles that are all stable will be transformed in a transfer function where the poles are located in this circle over here so they will remain stable in the z domain using this euler backward difference method but you can see also that some unstable systems in the s domain might become stable in the z domain because a pole to the right might be transformed in a pole that is inside the unit circle so this is the relation that we had right and the question was is this relation going to map the j omega axis into a circle that is centered in z is equal to a half and that has a radius of a half so what we do we substitute s is equal to j omega in the relation this is what you obtain 
you multiply numerator and denominator by the complex conjugate okay this allows you to write things like this j square is minus one so here you have a description of z now where you can kind of decompose in real part and imaginary part the real part is given over here the imaginary part is given over here so what you have to check now is that the real part minus a half squared plus the imaginary part squared is equal to the radius squared so the radius squared is 1 over 4 and we have a question over here we have to prove this so what we do is replace the real part of z by its value over here but you have minus a half okay so we put it under the same denominator so we'll have this expression here squared and this is simply the imaginary part squared so we put everything under the same denominator you can see that it is the same denominator we have a square over here this is the denominator and we put one quarter because one minus a half is a half here we have a half there a half to the power two so a quarter we can put it up front but then we have to put a four over here because there is no quarter over here so, so this is exactly the same thing so we can now compute this quantity over here and to the power two this is what you obtain this one will cancel out with this one and we'll have a two so and the, on the numerator we'll have exactly the same thing um, as what you see here on the denominator so indeed this is equal to a quarter okay so indeed this relation here maps the j omega axis into a circle that is centered in z is equal to a half and that has a radius of a half we can now present the euler forward difference method the ideas are very similar as you will notice so this is the output of the integrator at sample k it's the integrator at the previous sample k minus one plus a correction term and what you should add is the area here in blue okay and this area in blue will be approximated right? so it's this area over here by the rectangle that is given in gray okay so this time the area is approximated by well ts the base and the height is xk minus one okay so what we do is kind of project forward and uh, the value of xk minus one but well, we project it forward to the next sample this is why in french this is called la méthode des rectangles à gauche we use the left value x of k minus one okay so when we compare with the Euler forward difference we had the same equation but instead of xk minus one we had xk over here and when we go to the z domain we'll have the same equation except that we'll have a z minus one over here and this z minus one will appear over here right this is the transfer function when you work in z minus one and when we try work in the variable z we multiply by z on numerator denominator this is what you obtain right well using this Euler forward difference approximation method we have obtained an approximation of the continuous time integrator and the approximation that we have obtained is given over here so the idea will be to equate those two equations and to find a relation between s and c okay this is the relation that you obtain the idea is again to take your transfer function in s and replace s by z minus 1 over ts and you obtain 
a discrete time approximation of your original transfer function, right? Using this Euler forward method. If you write z as a function of s, uh, here s is written as a function of z, it's very easy to see that z is 1 plus dss. Again, exponential of x is approximately 1 plus x when x is small. So this is really approximating the relation that you have between the variable z and the variable s. But it's approximating. This is why you call this a numerical integration or numerical approximation method. Well, there is an intuition behind this formula over here. In the Laplace domain, if you do s, y, s, well, in the time domain, you're taking the derivative, okay? So if you do this thing here, you expect also to be taking a derivative, but in the z domain. And this is indeed the case. If you take the inverse z transform, you'll have yk plus 1 minus yk divided by ts so y of t plus ts minus yt divided by ts and this is closely related not the same thing as yt minus yt minus ts over ts when you compute the slope of a curve in discrete time this is the type of formula that you're using so this kind of makes sense well using this euler forward difference method we had used the following relation between the z domain and the s domain it's an approximation of the actual relation and it you will see that it will map the j omega axis this one over here on a vertical line this one over here it continues located in z is equal to one right so everything that is to the left of the j omega axis in the laplace domain will be mapped to the left of this vertical line z is equal to one in the z domain and as a consequence you can see that some stable s domain systems become unstable in the z domain if you use this numerical integration method okay well even if the problems are kind of small if ts is chosen sufficiently small this is a method that is not recommended so if you have to use an euler method use the euler backward difference method but the best thing to do is of course to use the method that we'll present next which is the trapezoidal method for numerical integration the next numerical integration method is the trapezoidal method we use again the same equation so y of k is the output of the integrator at sample k is the integrator or the output of the integrator at the previous sample plus a correction okay and this correction will approximate the area under the curve that i'm showing you right now so it's this area over here And as you can see, this area in blue can be approximated by the area of a trapezoid that is shown here in gray. The area of the trapezoid is the same as the area of a rectangle with base Ts and with height, the average of xk minus 1 and xk so this explains the term that has been added here it's the approximation of the area shown in blue 
right? So again, we go to the Z domain. So these two terms remain the same. So we have Ts over 2, Z minus 1 plus 1 X of Z. If you rewrite this, okay, in terms of Yz, this is what you obtain. So this is the transfer function of my discrete integrator in terms of the variable z minus 1. If you multiply numerator and denominator by z, this is what you obtain. So this is the discrete time integrator that has been obtained using the trapezoidal numerical approximation method. So we have obtained an approximation of the continuous time integrator using this uh, trapezoidal method and the discrete time integrator is this one so what we'll do is equate those two equations and this will yield a formula that you can use to obtain a discrete time description of a transfer function using this trapezoidal method. So it's really an approximation of the relation between the Z variable and the S variable. So you take your transfer function H of S, you replace it by this expression here and you have a numerical approximation of the transfer function, a transfer function in Z according to this trapezoidal method. So you can also write the relation by inverse mapping. So here it's S as a function of Z. You can also express Z as a function of S. So we'll have Ts over 2S times Z plus 1 is equal to Z minus 1. We take everything that is in Z on one side. So it's Z Ts over 2S minus 1 is equal to minus 1 minus ts over 2 right and this will yield this relation over here so for the 10,000th time we use this approximation of the exponential when x is small so this is the exponential here on the numerator of approximately the exponential of ts over 2s at the denominator we have the exponential of minus ts over 2s so indeed this relation over here is approximating the actual relation between z and s so this is the approximation of the actual relation between d s and z domain the actual relation is this one this one will approximate it right and it corresponds to the trapezoidal method for approximation and the trapezoidal numerical integration method and we will show next that this relation here this mapping maps the j omega axis so this axis over here onto the unit circle right and what is nice is that well this region to the left of the j omega axis is mapped inside the unit circle and this region to the right of the j omega axis is mapped outside the unit circle so a system that is stable in the s domain will be stable in the z domain okay and all systems that are unstable in the Laplace domain will remain unstable in the Z domain if you use this trapezoidal method. So this is kind of an improvement of what we had obtained with the Euler integration methods. So this inverse mapping will maps kind of the whole left off plane inside the unit circle as we have seen that the actual relation z is equal to the exponential of tss maps the left of the j omega axis to what is inside the unit circle but it does this in strips of width 2 pi over ts so this is an s over here minus jp ts and this is a 
strip of width 2 pi over ts this is the sampling frequency so there is still a distortion that crushes the whole j omega axis on the unit circle what we have over here is the approximate relation between z and s if we use the trapezoidal approximation and we want to see if well the j omega axis is mapped onto the unit circle so what we do is inject s is j omega in here this is what we have over here and we multiply by the complex conjugate of the denominator and you obtain this expression so the denominator will be a real huh, because it's a an expression times its complex conjugate so indeed this is what we observe and we can compute the square over here this is what you obtain so you can rewrite z as the real part of z and the imaginary part of z the real part of z is given over here the imaginary part of z is given over here so we have to check if the real part of z squared plus the imaginary part of z squared is equal to one okay if this is the case well the j omega axis will be mapped on a circle centered in zero of radius one okay so what we do here is take the square of this one take the square of this one the denominator is the same so we put everything under the de same denominator so we take the square of this one this is what you see over here and this is the square of the numerator of the real part and then we take the well square of the numerator of the imaginary part and you've got it over here right and then you can observe that of course you have a one so you can put a four over here and a four over here so that this one cancels right and this one becomes a plus two right so this is what you got over here but this is the same square as you have in the denominator so indeed this is equal to one here's a summary of the three numerical integration methods the two euler numerical integration methods and the trapezoidal method the idea is that you take your transfer function in s and you replace s by one of these relations in z and you end up with a transfer function in z the idea of course is that you look at the underlying recurrent equation because this is the equation that you'll be able to use we'll apply this to a first order system to a lead lag system and we'll use this to implement a pid controller on a processor remember that you have to use this one with caution because a stable p of s could become an unstable p of z when i say use it with caution this means that you have to use ts small enough with respect to the main time constants of the p of s you're approximating the next building block is the first order system a system that you know very well so a good example of that is the rc system so the output is the voltage on the capacitor and this is the input voltage so very easily we can obtain two expressions of the current it's the voltage on the resistor so v in minus vc over r and another expression is well c times the variations of the voltage on the capacitor so you obtain the equation rc dvc dt plus vc is equal to the input voltage right and this is the equation of a first order system if you reorganize this one you have t dpv dt plus pv is equal to kpmv 
So this is a first order system, time constant is RC and the gain obviously is 1. In steady state, the voltage on the capacitor is the input voltage, right? If you go to the Laplace domain, this is the transfer function that you obtain and you should be able to obtain the step response. Let's say step very easily. So it's the transfer function times 1 over s, right? This is h of s, x of s. So this you can rewrite by partial fraction expansion as kp times 1 over s minus t over ts plus 1. You can check if you put it under the same denominator, this is what you obtain. Then the inverse Laplace transform gives you y step, and the step response here is kp times 1 minus the exponential of time over constant u of t. Right, so this should be a reminder. Well, here we have the unit step response of a first order system. You can see here that we have the unit step and in green the unit step response. Here I'm doing everything in details, but really I shouldn't do this because this is of course a reminder. We have seen that the step response is kp 1 minus the exponential of time over time constant right so you can kind of see that when t is equal to 0 we have a 1 minus 1 here so this is what you have and when t is going to tend to infinity this one is going to tend to 0 so the steady state response will be simply kp right so what you can then do is look at well intermediate values and here the output is normalized with respect to the gain and you can see that at the time constant you have a response of 63.2 percent of the steady state response where does that come from well this number is simply equal to this one where you replace time by the time constant so it's 1 minus the exponential of minus 1 and if you take your calculator this is the value that you obtain you can see here that after five times the time constant well you have reached more than 99 percent of the steady state value what you can do is take this one and take the derivative the idea here is to compute the slope at the origin. If I take the derivative of this one, well, this term will not contribute, so we'll have kp minus the exponential, right? And then times minus 1 over t, and we evaluate this at t is equal to 0, and we see that we obtain kp over t. Right. Another way to do this is to use these formulas of section 2 that we had derived. We have to look at a step response, of course. And we are interested in the slope. And we had seen that this is really the limit when s is tending to infinity of s times the transfer function minus pv zero this one is zero as you can see over here so this is the limit when s is tending to infinity of s times the transfer function so this is s times kp over ts plus one and as you can see of course you obtain the same result if we look now at this tangent at the origin it has a slope kp over t so this means that if you take an horizontal increase of the time constant well then you have a vertical increase of kp right so indeed 
this is a way to obtain the time constant when this tangent meets the horizontal that corresponds to the steady state well this will happen at a time that corresponds to the time constant so this is one way to obtain or to determine the time constant experimentally the second way is to take well 63.2% of the final steady state response and this will also correspond to a time that is the time constant we had seen that the step response is given by this expression here here y is pv and if we look here at the shaded area in pink well you can obtain the surface of this zone by taking the integral from 0 to infinity of really kp this is the steady state value right minus PV that corresponds to the step response. So this quantity here is really KP minus the PV step, right? And here you have it, PV step response. If you do this minus this, this is what you obtain. And if you do the calculations, you'll see here that this surface corresponds to KP p times t so this leads to a third method to obtain the time constant well it consists in obtaining an approximation of this shaded area using for instance numerical integration this is very easy to implement on a computer once you have computed well this surface you simply divide by the gain of the system and you have an estimate of the time constant this procedure is rather robust to well measurement noise that you would have on PV as this measurement noise will average out when you compute the surface here indicated in pink a first order system is described using a first order differential equation hence the name first order system and here is this first order differential equation you can translate it to a block diagram and as you can see here the derivative of pv with respect to time is 1 over t kpmv right minus pv right so this is the derivative of pv with respect to time and to obtain pv well you need an integrator over here Right, so this can be used to obtain a first order relation on your PLC. For instance, if you have an integrator block at your disposal. So the intuition, if you put a step at the input, 0, 1. So you'll have the same step, but influ amplified, sorry, to 0 kp right and we'll assume here that pv at the time of the step is 0 so we have here kp this will be divided by t and then we have something positive of course very important we assume here that t is positive otherwise we'll have a problem here we'll have a loop here that will go to an unstable situation so we have here kp over t something positive this will be integrated so at if you have something positive at the input of the integrator well you have pv that is going to increase this is what you see over here right so if t is larger this simply means that the slope at the origin you can compute it it's kp over t will be smaller so this the increase will be smaller and of course this is going to settle at some stage right you can see this intuitively that the steady state situation will be a situation and we've seen this before where the input of the 
integrator must be zero. If it is not zero, positive or negative, it will lead to a PV that is increasing or decreasing. So this is not the steady state situation. So the only way to have a steady state situation is to have here a zero at the input of the integrator. So this means that PV is constant, but this constant, of course, must be Kp, because the only way to have a zero here is that you have Kp over here and Kp over here. So you can see that indeed this is going to lead to a step response that looks like this, as we have seen before. And with a t that is larger, well, this is simply going to take more time. But in the end, you'll have the same steady state situation. Of course, we are also interested in the frequency response of our first order system. And you remember that we have to take P of S, the transfer function, and evaluate it at S is equal to J omega. So we need the module of P when evaluated on the J omega axis, and we need the argument right of P when S is replaced by J omega, and this is necessary for the top part of the body diagram, and this is necessary for the bottom part of the body diagram. This shows the steady state gain. And when you apply a sign at the input, you'll have a sign at the output in steady state. And the amplification is given by this quantity. This sign is what will be well, kind of shifted. And this will be shown by this quantity over here. So if we replace P of S and and we replace s by j omega this is what you obtain this is a complex number and what you can do with the complex number is well obtain is module and its argument one way to do this is to compute the real part and the imaginary part so what is done over here is that at the numerator and denominator we multiply by the complex conjugate this is what is done over here and it's now very easy to obtain the real part and the imaginary part. The module, this is obtained as follows, and this is the expression that you obtain, and the argument is simply the arc tangent of the imaginary part over the real part, and this is what you obtain, right? So, for the moment, I will not go into the details, but you can see here that at the zero frequency, right, we have a module of Kp. This corresponds to the static gain right and at very high frequencies well you see that this module will go to zero and the argument well at the zero frequency well this will lead to a phase shift of zero degrees and at very high frequencies this will tend to minus 90 degrees if we represent the expressions that we had found for p evaluated on the j omega axis and here we have the module and here the argument and we do this in a Bode diagram where you use log frequencies and you use decibels for the module this is what you obtain and we'll come back to that later and see how you can We'll see how you can obtain this in a more maybe intuitive way. For the moment, I'm interested in the intuition behind this Bode diagram. Remember that here at the input, what we do is put an input MV of T that is a sinusoid. Right, and here the frequency can vary. And what we'll have here, and this is very important, this is in steady state. If we look at the steady state output, this means that the transients have disappeared. We'll have a PV in steady state, that is really a sinusoid at the same frequency, but it will be amplified by this module and the amplification you can read it over here and this sign will be at the same frequency but it will be shifted and this is this argument of P 
be evaluated on the j omega axis and this shift can be read here in this second part of the boat diagram so you can see here in the low frequencies here we have a gain of one that what you have is really a gain that is one zero db so there is no amplification or attenuation and the phase shift is very small so this sign here at the input will look a lot like the output that you'll have in steady state again but then at the i frequencies you can see here that well of course what you have at the output will be very strongly attenuated right and there will be a phase shift of approximately minus 90 degrees and then of course you have a limiting situation and this limiting situation will be at the cutoff frequency right and this cutoff frequency is 1 over t you can see here that this first order system has of course a low pass behavior okay signs that are have a small frequency smaller than the cutoff frequency well they pass through the system hardly changed so now we'll do this in a more intuitive way so we'll do what we have done before evaluate the transfer function on the j omega axis and for this first order system this is what you obtain and we'll define the cutoff frequency as one over the time constant and then you can rewrite this evaluation of the transfer function on the j omega axis as follows we'll consider three situations omega much smaller than the cutoff frequency omega much larger than the cutoff frequency and omega equal to the cutoff frequency if omega is much smaller than the cutoff frequency you can see here in the denominator that this one here plays a very small role right so we can see that the module is approximately kp and since this one is approximately kp well the associated phase shift is zero degree right if omega is much larger than the cutoff frequency right well it is this first term that will be dominating right so p of j omega is approximately kp over j omega omega c right and this is equal to k p omega c over j omega and this is of course also equal to k p j omega time constant right so you can see here this is 1 over j so the another way to write this is to write minus j kp over omega t right so the module is kp over omega t and the argument is simply minus 90 degrees so at the high frequencies we have a phase shift of minus 90 degrees and we see here that the module is decreasing as 1 over omega so now we can consider the case where omega is equal to the crossover frequency and then p of j omega is really you replace omega by omega c so we have kp over j plus 1 right and if you write this in polar form you'll have kp over the square root of 2 exponential of minus j pi over 4 so you can see here that the module is kp over the square root of 2 and that the phase shift is minus 45 degrees right so we can have a look here the gain at the low frequencies is kp right so if we look at the 
gain in uh, dBs will have 20 log 10, right? Kp over square root of 2. And we can rewrite this as 20 log 10 Kp. This is the gain at the low frequencies and we'll have plus 20 log 10 of 1 over the square root of 2 and if you compute this you take your calculator and you will see that this is minus 3 dBs okay so at the cutoff frequency you'll have a drop in the gain of minus 3 dBs if you compare with the situation at the low frequencies well, using this more intuitive way of working, you can obtain the approximation of the first order body diagram here shown in blue. Let us start with the gain, the module of P evaluated on the J omega axis. At the low frequencies, it's equal to Kp. So this is where you're going to read the static gain of the system beware because my arrow here should point to very far away because the static gain is at omega is equal to zero and of course we work in db so what we read is 20 log 10 of kp in this case the gain is one so it's zero db we see that at the cutoff frequency and in this case here omega c is equal to one over T is 1 well you have a drop of minus 3 dBs with respect to the static gain so this means here that the gain at the cutoff frequency in this case is well this 0 dB minus 3 dB so you have a gain of minus 3 dB we had seen that the module of p on the j omega axis at the high frequency so this is really omega much higher than the cutoff frequency is kp divided by omega t so in the high frequencies over here well the first order system behaves like an integrator and therefore we have a drop 1 over omega but this will look like this so you have a drop here with a slope of minus 20 dBs per decade so you should look at the integrator example to see how we had found this decrease of the gain with a slope of minus 20 dBs per decade so if we look at the phase shift we had seen that at the small frequencies the phase shift was approximately zero that at the cutoff frequency it's 45 degrees and at the high frequencies it's minus 90 degrees so the real relation is shown here in magenta so it, this is this arc tangent but it can be approximated by working in this way over here so what you do is that you use a phase shift of zero up to a frequency that corresponds to one decade before the cutoff frequency and then you use a linear decrease up to the point where the phase shift is minus 90 degrees you have to pass through this point over here so you will see that this leads to a linear decrease up to a frequency that is one decade after the cutoff frequency and this gives you a nice approximation we can also have a look at the impulse response of a first order system the input will be a Dirac impulse so x of s will be the Laplace transform of this Dirac impulse and this is really one so we have a one over here so this explains that the Laplace transform of the impulse response is simply 
P of S, but that's the definition, right, of a transfer function. It's the Laplace transform of its impulse response. So this one we can rewrite as KP over T, T over TS plus 1, right? And this can be further rewritten to KP over T, 1 over S plus 1 over T. And now it's crystal clear that if you take the inverse Laplace transform, this is what you obtain. Using these equations that we had obtained by considering the initial and final value theorems, you can have well information at the origin on well the response and its derivative, and you can also have information about the steady state response this is simply an application of this formula so if we look at this what well, response we can make a drawing and this is how it will look like right so the response is causal so it's zero for negative t and then we have something like this right as you can see the impulse response will tend to zero the peak that you see over here is kp over t right this is simply obtained by the initial value theorem and you can also compute the slope at the origin it's really the slope at the right of this origin because this means that it's the limit of the slope when t tends to zero but from above because of course there is a discontinuity so you can draw the tangent over here and this tangent will have slope minus kp over t square so if you take a horizontal increase of 1, you have a decrease of minus kp over t square. So if you make a horizontal increase of t here, you have a decrease of minus kp over t. is yes, this one times t, right? So this means that if you draw the tangent, right, and you look at the time where this tangent meets the time axis well this corresponds to the time constant right so this is the signature of the impulse response for a first order system we had already obtained the unit step response of a first order system and its time domain response you can also obtain information at the origin and in steady state and using those formula we obtain that the slope at the origin of the step response is indeed kp over t as we had seen intuitively we are of course interested in a discrete time approximate description of this first order system and therefore we can use the numerical integration methods that we have seen previously we'll use the two euler numerical integration methods but you can also of course use the trapezoid approximation method i'll leave it as an exercise so what we have to do to use this euler backward difference approximation is to inject s given by this expression here in the transfer function of our first order system and if you do that this is what you obtain right so we'll rewrite things in terms of k which is the sampling period divided by the time constant and in reality will this k should be smaller or much smaller than 0 0.1 right so if you inject that in this well discrete time transfer function this is what we'll obtain kp over z minus 1 z 
k, right? k is t s over t plus plus 1. If we multiply at the numerator and denominator by zk, this is what we obtain. This is the discrete time transfer function. Well, we are not really interested in this discrete time transfer function. We're interested in the discrete time relation, right? So how can we obtain it? This is really the output divided by the input. I should say the Z transform of the output over the Z transform of the input. So you can rewrite this as 1 plus K Z minus 1 times Y of Z is equal to kp k z x of z right so we'll have 1 plus k if we take the inverse z transform we'll have 1 plus k y k plus 1 right minus y k is equal to kp k x k plus 1 right so this equation can be rewritten as follows and this is the recursive equation that will approximate the continuous time description of a first order system and this is something that you can implement on a plc and i will actually show you an application in pcs7 you can also use the euler forward difference approximation method and the only difference lies in this well, expression of z previously we had here a z at the denominator the method is exactly the same but of course it will result in a different discrete time relation and here k is also this k that we had in the previous slide so it's the ratio sampling period over time constant we have to use this Euler forward difference method with caution okay because it could happen that the system here first order is of course stable if t is positive but that the approximation becomes unstable so in practice you should use it with caution this means that well k here has to be chosen sufficiently small so typically much smaller than 0.1 which means that the sampling period is much smaller than the time constant of the system i have prepared the code for this first order filter its name is fo for first order filter here are the inputs the first input is a boolean input that allows you to enable and disable the block then you have of course the parameters of the first order system the gain the time constant the lag time constant the sampling time have added a mode so you can choose the algorithm either Euler backward difference or Euler forward difference and of course here the input of the first order filter that is going to be filtered so you can see over here the output and this is the output the filtered input if you like this is here a constant that will be used but that is not kept into memory this is going to be this ts over t that you saw in the slide and what you see over here are variables that are kept into memory this is the previous input and this is the previous output this init variable we'll discuss later but this previous input and previous output are necessary because we implement a recursive equation and the output for instance is computed as a function of the previous output so this previous output you need to keep it into memory the actual code is in between begin and end function block. If the time constant is positive, 
well the two recurrence equations are implemented and well according to the mode you select either the first one or the second one k is this constant ts over t lag that we had in the slide what we have over here is the Euler backward difference implementation and here the Euler forward difference implementation and as you can see in the Euler backward difference imp implementation the output is constructed from the previous output of course and the actual input right so we are projecting back here the output is constructed from the previous output and from the previous input we are projecting forward right if the time constant is negative or the algorithm is not enabled we see that the output is initialized at input times gain at the end of the code previous input is set to input and previous output is set to output so that at the next iteration well the previous output and the previous input is available for the algorithm remember that previous input and previous output is kept in memory from one iteration to another the bit of code that you see over here is to make sure that the output is initialized at input times gain the first time that the algorithm is run so here in it is a variable that is kept in memory and that is initialized at one it's a boolean variable so that if you go through the code the first time as in it is one you go through the code and you set output to gain times input so that the output is initialized correctly and then you set in it to zero so that well you never enter this bit of code again in this fashion if you use your block and you're putting in it in a program and you compile and download in a algorithm that is running well you will not have the output of the filter that is initialized to zero because that would be problematic here you will have that the output will be initialized directly at a value that is well what you expect and then from there on the first order filter will start to function if it would have been initialized at zero it would take well roughly five times the time constant for the output to reach its working point well once the block is ready you have to assign an fb number to your function or your symbol fo once that is done you can compile the block and you can see here zero error zero warnings and then well this block becomes available here in the list i can over here we see it this is the block first order well once the block has been compiled it becomes available in cfc you find it over here fb7 first order filter i've brought it over here in the control function chart here i'm just going to test the block so there are no links that come from somewhere else or that go somewhere else so what i will do is compile my code i just added the block so i need only to compile changes and then i can download to my emulated plc and then we can have a look and see what happens and here you see that the input is 10 for the moment and the output is 10 as well and we'll just make a change and see what happens on a curve I have prepared a trend and in this trend we will see two curves well the input of the first order filter and the output of the first order filter so we can start the acquisition and go back to our block you can see here that the 
time constant is 10 seconds that the sampling period is 0.1 second so this block runs in a cycle that runs every 0.1 second the mode is one okay so we use Euler backward difference so let's make a change over here of 50 percent and let's go and have a look as you can see here in black we see the step change and in blue the response of the first water filter right the time constant is 10 seconds so we expect that after roughly five times the time constant so 50 seconds we are at well steady state or more or less at the steady state so this seems to be okay so we have tested this block here in cfc and since it is found to be okay we can use it in any program well we have now all the building blocks to construct the board diagram of a first order system with delay and this type of system is sometimes called a broider system so we have really two parts we have this first order dynamics right and we have in blue maybe the pure delay the Bode diagram of this first order dynamics is given here in magenta right underneath this green curve over here you have this magenta curve and this is really the gain of this first order dynamics as a function of frequency and we have also the phase shift here as a function of frequencies so for the pure delay we remember that the body diagram will is a gain of one at all frequencies so zero db and well we had of course that this pew delay is introducing a phase shift at the frequency one over theta we had a phase shift of well one radian so 57 degrees one over theta is one radian per second over here so we have a phase shift of minus 57 degrees right so the phase shift will look something like this right so we have the Bode diagram of the first order dynamics in magenta and we have the Bode diagram of the pure delay in blue so what you can do now is add things and you obtain of course the body diagram of a first order with delay represented here in green in terms of the gain as a function of frequency of course there is no difference with respect to a first order right this is kind of logical because a delay is not amplifying or attenuating things it's just changing things as far as the phase shift is concerned okay and by adding the phase shift associated to this first order system and to the pure delay this is what you obtain well given the body diagram given here in green you should be able to see that this corresponds indeed to a first order system with delay and you should be able also to obtain the gain kp the time constant t and the delay theta how do we proceed well we can see here that the static gain of this process is kp just evaluate the transfer function at s is equal to zero we can read the static gain in the body diagram at the very low frequencies and we can see here that this static gain is 0 db so 1 and this leads to a kp of 1 right the time constant well we know that at the cutoff frequency omega c is 1 over the time constant we have an drop of minus 3 dBs 
with respect to the situation at the low frequencies. So here we have this drop of minus 3 dBs. So this must be here omega c is equal to 1 over the time constant, right? So the time constant is equal to 1 second in this case. So since kp, the gain, and the time constant is, are fixed, you can kind of imagine the body diagram of the underlying first order system. It will have the same well, gain response as a function of frequency, and you can kind of imagine the frequency response. So the, the phase response as a function of frequencies. So now we have to look for the frequency 1 over theta that will add an additional phase shift of 1 radiant. 1 radiant is 57 degrees. And you can see here clearly that at this frequency here, we have an additional phase shift of 57 degrees. So 1 over theta is equal to 1 radiant per second, right? So this means that theta is equal to 1. Well, let us do a, a little quiz over here. And the question is, identify the Bode diagrams of Kp ts plus 1 and kp ts plus 1 times this exponential of minus theta s and here kp are 10 the time constant is 10 seconds and the delay is 1 right and as you can see you have to choose between five candidates right so let us first look at the gain right we see that the gain is 10. So this is really the static gain. In dB, 20 log 10 of 10 is of course 20. So here at the low frequencies we can read the static gain and well A is consistent with a gain of 10, B is not, C is not consistent, D is not consistent and E is consistent with a gain of 10. So this means now that we are have only two candidates left, A and E. Let us look at the time constant. It's 10, so we see or we know that at the cutoff frequency 1 over the time constant, so 0 0.1, we need minus 3 dBs with respect to the low frequency situation. This corresponds for A. But we see that it corresponds to E as well. Okay, at omega C here we have minus 3 dBs. Okay, so we are still left with two candidates, A and E. And of course, we have to use the additional information, right? We know that at 1 over theta, right, we'll have an additional phase shift of one radian so 57 degrees so one over theta so it's one radian per second this is in blue here the phase shift as a function of frequency of the Bode diagram of the original first order system and we see that at omega is equal to one we have an additional phase shift of 57 degrees. So this one is consistent with the three parameters. Let's have a look at solution E. And here we see that the additional phase shift is at a frequency of 0.1 radians per second. So this corresponds to a theta that is 10 seconds, right? So the only candidate that is consistent with what we see here on the screen is solution A. Well, this is a quiz and it's the type of quiz that you might have at the time of the exam. Well, this means also that you have to master all the signatures of the systems that we consider 
in this course so an integrator a delay a first order a lead like system a second order system higher order systems and you have to master them in the time domain and the frequency domain